How did you get so cold enough to chew my bones? It feels like I don't know you anymore. I don't understand why you're so cold to me. Well, one of you requested that I solve another physics paper. Well, yeah, I guess I will. Um, so with this, just hold on. Um, scalar quantities is just all your quantities that have magnitude but the difference is if you say north south or west then you give a direction that that's when it becomes a scalar quantity so um state how a scalar quantity differs from a vector one um the scalar quantity doesn't have direction underline two scalar quantities force can go up impulse and momentum are basically really similar so you can have momentum to the right impulse to the right that's why they have direction so they're not scalar so the only thing is just energy and temperature you can't give them direction um so when you draw a constant speed graph or whatever um the reason it's like this sloping like that is because when distance increases the actual distance formula is distance equals speed times time so when distance increases time increases so if you check this point here time and distance increase if you check this point here and here this line you see distance and time increase so they, in they increase proportionally and then if you check um, the actual speed here this can be a fixed value and since when this increases this increases speed doesn't really have to change it just has to be like a certain value because since distance is on the y-axis and time is on the x-axis it can be in the form y equals mx so this gradient doesn't change and so if m doesn't change the same thing you can just mirror and say speed doesn't change that's why the graph looks like this if it's like this you know times increasing but speeds not so you're changing s to make this value stay the same even here if time if distance is increasing and time is staying the same you're changing s so that distance can increase but time can't that's why that's why these are not constant ones and the only constant one is this but anyway if you don't want to remember that explanation which is kind of clear it helps just know that anything that goes like this through the origin is a constant line for no matter what graph okay so the boat goes 6.5 meters per second to the left uh, which is west west is always to the left and then it goes down south 3.5 meters so I put in my angles and my 62 degrees well I put in all the angles and um, a, a right angle triangle because that's what it forms because if you you start here and you end here so your resultant goes like this that's always the rule so wherever you end you go to your start point and draw the arrow there so if you got an angle between 26 to 30.5 you get your marks I just put in all my angles just put in all the information to get the four marks so the scale is one centimeter to one meter per second that's easy so if this is six centimeters it's six meter per second then you just add half a centimeter because literally one centimeter is equal to one meter per second that's the scale i chose um so the size the resultant velocity i got is this is this arrow you would measure it with your scale and then you would put it down for me i use pythagoras and i got it even though you are supposed to use your scale I can't because I did this on a tablet so yep I can't do that now the direction of the resultant so this thing's direction this arrow is obviously going like this but it's not going north only or like just east because if you see this this is your north south east west it's actually going like this so what's that that's actually 62 it's north but it's 62 degrees north because it's an it's at an angle. Yeah, it's at an angle here, and I calculated that angle. There, that's how you do it. Because even if this is south, it's basically, yeah. Even if that's south, it's going up. Anything that goes up is north. So when you measure this 62 degrees here, you just you found the angle which this line goes up 62 degrees. And since it's going up, it's going north, so it goes 62 degrees north. Now this one is easy. If you read this, it says that whatever the mass, whatever the acceleration is on Earth, 
which is a fixed value g, your acceleration on the moon is one sixth of that. So the weight on the moon is the mass of this thing on earth multiply the gravity due to acceleration but then the gravity due to acceleration always has to be multiplied by one sixth because to get the gravity due to acceleration on the moon it always has to be one sixth of that of the earth so that's why you always have to multiply the gravity of the earth by one sixth to get it to the gravity of the moon but then because the order of multiplication doesn't matter you can put mg times one by six and remember the weight on the moon that's what the m is weight on the moon so actual weight on the earth is equal to mass times gravity due to acceleration on earth so that's here so weight on earth is equal to mg but mg is also equal to weight on earth so you can replace these two with weight on earth so you see here whatever the weight is on the moon is always one sixth of that on the earth so that's why it makes sense that the weight of the vehicle on the moon is always one sixth of the value on earth see how that makes sense and then the same value as on earth mass is always the same that's why you just tick that box the mass is the same regardless wherever you are now whenever you accelerate some whenever you decelerate something you if you want to decelerate something quickly you press the brake hard if you want to decelerate it slowly you press it soft whatever it is you have to press it with a certain force now that force causes it to decelerate at a rate and then that rate is the same wor wherever you are except the only thing that can change that rate is the surface but the surface of the moon is not exactly enough to cause um, a deceleration to be too great like six times higher or a sixth lower so the deceleration acceleration of a vehicle with the same braking force will decelerate at the same rate as on earth so it's the same on earth though the time it takes for it to decelerate would be maybe a bit higher because um the only thing that can make something decelerate faster is the surface and this is why the question is a bit Cambridge really on this paper I'm not too sure what they're doing but that's why this question is a bit like not so real life because if you thought about it the only thing everything decelerates if you have a car two identical cars and you press the same braking force they're going to decelerate at the same rate on the road even if you put one on the moon or one in jupiter but the problem is if that surface changes of course one is going to decelerate faster because of friction though not six times or six faster or slower but relatively similar Though it's not exactly close to real life because at least one of those cars would have accelerated or decelerated faster. So you choose the more relevant option which is this one. Okay this thing here. So what they do tell you with this question is that the pressure increases by this much. So because of the formula that we have you just plug it in you get the force 325 newtons. And the thing is 325 newtons was pushes on this area because it says on the question here the pressure increases because you push this area with the force you can only assume it goes like this because the piston goes in like that so the force goes in this direction and that's the value of the force now realize that the force is connected to the pedal by this link and it's a part of the pedal so this thing here says exerted that means it's past tense that means the force exerted here was already done so that means this thing was not originally here it might have originally been here or here whatever it is the driver pushed it and it moved a certain distance and because it would probably be here because in in you check real life the pedals are always like this and then you push in and it goes here that's just the logic so when you push it it goes a certain distance and it goes clockwise so it goes a certain distance clockwise but since this link is connected here it makes sense the link is connected here as well so both of them go a certain distance and both of them go clockwise and since they're connected to the same pedal they both rotate about the same pivots so when I multiply the force to push the piston by the seven centimeters which is the perpendicular distance you can see I'm gonna get the moment about 
the pivot. And because I, I'm going to get the moments, moments is the same because for, for the pedal and this link because they're both connected and they both travel clockwise for a certain distance. So the moment moved by the force in, in here, the clockwise direction, has to be the same moment as the one moved by the pedal in the clockwise direction here because both of them are rotating about the same pivot and both of them went the same distance and the same direction which is clockwise so it just makes sense that their moment has to be the same so force times 24 because that's the force direct by the driver and that's the distance 24 the perpendicular di distance to the pivot and that's going to equal the force which is 3 to 5 newtons multiplied by 7 centimeters. So that's the moment if you were to rotate it about the point here from here. That's how much force you would require 3 to 5 newtons. 7 times, I mean, you multiply this times that. That's how much you would require to move it, to move this point about here. And that's going to equal 24 times the force F. And then you rearrange, you get this 95 newtons. Now realize this only only works because this link was actually a part of the pedal and both of them rotated about this pivot and we know that there was an increase in pressure here but the increase in pressure was caused because of a force and we found out what the force is but that's just the force for pushing the piston but then if we and we know the direction of the force acts like this and so if we multiply it by seven centimeters we're going to get the distance which is seven centimeters multiplied the perpendicular distance which is 7 centimeters multiplied by a force which is the moment formula and that's going to give us the moment about about the pivot and that moment about the pivot is equal to the moment caused by about the pivot which is caused by the force by the driver because both of them are connected to the same pedal and both of them move clockwise for the same direction that's why you have that so yep, let's hope that explains that. Ah uh, yep, and let's do this. Um, this thing with moment and impulse, like what's an impulse and what's moment? Like let's first understand what's momentum, sorry, momentum. The other one was moment, just leave that. So momentum, momentum is when you, if you have a punching bag or yeah, a punching bag and you punch it, you're gonna realize that it's gonna move and then it's going to reach a final speed v and you realize something else the mass of the bag stayed the same before and after you punched it so you you figure out that the mass is the same and then you understand that the moment it had when it was stationary or its original moment was the mass times the the speed which is a value and then after you punched it you got another moment which was the mass times its new final speed. And when you subtracted those two, you found out how much moment the punching bag got, how much it acquired, the difference. You found out how much it got. And then you realize, wait, that's a change in momentum. Yep, that's a change in momentum. And then he's like, what caused the change in momentum? It was you. When you punched that punching bag with a force, you punch it for a certain time. And then that's why... You, when you multiply those two, it's equal to a change in momentum. You see how that makes sense? Yep. Now let's go. So impulse's formula is force times time, by the way. So impulse, force times time, is equal to change in momentum. And I explained it with my analogy of the punching bag. So, okay, shows a collision. I don't even have to read this because you know that because of this line here, you know that A is going to collide with B. And then they're going to stick together and go with a new velocity. So if they stick together, that means their masses have to be the combined mass of both of them, which is 2.4 plus 1.2, and you know they're going at a new velocity. And if you want to confirm it here, stick together. The moment of block A before the collision. So before the collision is obviously you find this moment, mass times velocity. It's here 7.2 kg meter per second. The velocity V, there's a momentum before and after is always the same it's always conserved momentum is always conserved so before collision is 2.4 times that you got the momentum of that i mean you got the moments of a and then you have to add it to the moment of b but b doesn't have any momentum i keep saying moments of momentum just excuse me it's actually momentum 
So the momentum is zero because it's not moving here and this has a momentum. That momentum is equal to the mass of these two because they stuck together times the velocity which we're going to find out. And then you find the velocity, 2 meter per second. The impulse experienced by the block B during collision. So impulse is always force times time but you have no force times time. So what you think is impulse is a change in momentum. So what's the change in momentum? Well, during collision, A is going to hit B and that's going to cause an impulse because when it hits something, it causes an impulse when it causes its momentum to change. So because B's momentum changed, we know that B is actually 1.2 kg multiplied by the new speed that both a and B are traveling at both A and B travel at two meters per second. That's why they're not um, separating from each other because both of them travel at the same speed. So according to uh, momentum, the is a change impulse is a change in momentum. So the mass of B is one point two, and you multiply by its final speed, which is two meters per second, and you subtract it from the original momentum. It had no momentum originally. But after it gained momentum, because it's 1.2, it's mass times its new speed, 2 meters per second. And then you get the impulse. And then here, the thing about kinetic energy is that kinetic energy is not always conserved. Momentum is always conserved. So when you, the reason here is that when A hits B, either energy is lost to sound or lost to, um, or energy is transferred to heat energy. A balloon contains a fixed mass of gas. Explain in terms of momentum molecules. Okay, so you would say the molecules hit each other, causing a change in momentum with each other, with every other molecule of gas gaining um, momentum. The combined momentum then enables the gas molecules to hit the walls of the gas, the walls of the balloon, and this exerts a pressure. Yep, that's how you would say it. Explain in terms of molecules why the pressure... Yeah, you just read this. When the volume is increased, particles collide more frequently with the walls of the balloon. And as they give, as the given area they collide with is also reduced. So if you want to understand this, it's just that when the volume is reduced, reduced particles, they, they will collide more frequently. There, one mark, you got it. And they'll co collide frequently more with the walls of the ball, um, balloon. But why would they collide more frequently with the balloon? Is because when the volume is decreased, let's say there was one molecule hitting one part of the balloon. But since the volume is decreased, now there's three. So basically, the given area that that molecule used to originally hit, now it has more neighboring molecules and they're going to hit that specific given area. The initial volume of the gas is 500 cm cubed, blah, blah, blah. Calculate the new pressure. Okay, pressure, uh, I forgot to put that symbol. Pressure is directly proportional to, um, proportional to, it's actually, it's inversely proportional to the volume, and then you find that constant K, and then, Pressure is equal to K by the volume because it's inversely proportional. And then, of course, you just do the calculation normally. It's not that hard, actually. Um, an electric kettle. Okay, so this is what happens. You want to calculate how much energy and make sure this is in grams. Mass is always in kg for specific heat capacity. So you find out how much energy it takes to boil water to get water to 100 degrees Celsius from 20 degrees Celsius and then energy also has another formula called power times time and then what this explains is that it takes this much energy but then the power you have to leave the power on for a certain period of time to get to that energy so what's the time of course you just divide the energy by the power and you find the time 70 seconds stay one assumption yep no thermal energy was lost to the surroundings that's what you assume all the time but in real life, that doesn't happen. Place hot water in a bottle. Measure the initial temperature of the water. Oh, yeah. Okay. So what they mean here is this is also not so real life because the water mixes and then first you have to pour the hot water into the bottle. And then the thing is when I checked the marking scheme, it was 
they want you to assume that the thing is there's something that splits it in between so you can measure each side normally but that's not that doesn't really happen in real life it's just like they painted this side this side black and that side white and then you put in water so it's not a real real life experiment it's not so accurate to real life and that's what i've noticed is happening but it's enough i guess and then they just want to test the student's ability. A thermometer doesn't really measure the surroundings properly. It has to be immersed in a liquid. So just read this here. It should help you. Now, what I want to say with um, wave with lambda, the wavelength, is always from one point to the next point with the same y-axis in the same direction, y-coordinate in the same direction. So this point has a xy-coordinate. This point has an xy coordinate, but the, it has the same y coordinate as this, but it's going in the downward direction. So it's not, you can't use that point, but this point has the same xy coordinate and is going in an upward direction. So that's why lambda is from this point to here. And I chose that point because it's easy to read. So that's 30 centimeters. Amplitude is from the undisturbed level to the max point, which is 3.4 centimeters. Um, Velocity equals f times wavelength, the lambda. I just calculate it easily. Yeah, here what you would do is it would. This is how the wave pattern goes. It's like it's bent, then the bend goes and goes and becomes the original one. This happens because it it gets bent here, but the the bending reduces afterwards and it goes like this. I suggest you do at least one, two, three, four, five, at least eight waves because. They need they need a lot and even if it's for two marks just at least show that this was bending and this was bending and this then it became more curved and then it went back to its original wave um, to its original wave crest formation um, yes yeah, so I've everything is done here so state and explain how the wavelength in the deeper water has changed so um, velocity equals f lambda they did say it was faster in deep water. So since it's faster and the frequency doesn't change because the frequency wave remains constant. So this is constant. That means if this increases, this has to increase because they're directly proportional. So wavelength is greater in deep water as the wave has higher speed. There. Um, also, if since it has, apart from the change of wavelength, describe one other difference in the pattern formed by crest after the wave passes through the gap. Since they did say that the wavelength is different, so the frequent, yeah, the wavelength is different, and we found that in the deeper water, the wavelength was greater. So this wavelength, if you get a greater wavelength, is going to more, more, is going to resemb resemble the barrier distance more. And since it does that, see, if you have a larger wavelength, a larger wavelength. Is not always good for diffraction the you get greatest diffraction when the length between these barriers is the same as the wavelength when this wavelength was with this length here when it passes through you only get this much which is what, what we thought but then this one actually becomes longer so of course you would get more diffraction because the wavelength increases and the length here doesn't so you have more of a wavelength that's more similar to the length here so you get more diffraction or else you could say crests are more curved if you're not too sure because these these two here the crests they are more curved so that's it and they said describe once only put one so um this refractive index is sine i by sine r or else is the speed of light in air divided by the speed of light in whatever else you want it to be in. So that's how you use the formula to find this. And then here, you of course, use the sine i by sine r version. Okay, here, our light refracts into your eye because it goes from different mediums, but then the actual image is formed with the reflected ray. So if you draw the rays backwards, you get the image i, which I've done here. And this is just the normal. It passes straight through, so it doesn't get refracted. And of course, I did not use a ruler, and because I was doing it on my laptop, it was pretty hard. But if you do it in paper, they'll intersect. Here, let me just say something about this. It's it's a nice question, 
but I'll get to that quickly. They're current in the lamp at normal brightness. So at normal brightness, they give you all the information you need. So you use P equals IV, you find the formula. Even here you have I and V, you just find the resistance of the lamp at normal brightness. They give you all, it's really easy. But here, they say AB is one meter long and its resistance is five ohms. Now, they say the sliding contact is moved to B. So of course, if it was at X and that was normal brightness, but you're moving it more. So the current has to go for a longer distance. So the resistance is increased just normally. Resistance increases, distance increases there. Now this question here, I don't like it. It's three marks, but you got to think a bit. You can only do this question if you're smart in math or else if you do A-level. I mean, there was no way to really do this question. I'm sorry for you guys, but I'll explain it. Okay, so this question with this resistance is equal to V by I. First, you need to calculate resistance. Now, let me tell you something. With this circuit set up at X, when this thing's at X, it's at normal brightness. At normal brightness, we know the current is 1.5. And let me tell you something. The current in the series circuit is the same no matter where you measure it from. So the current of 1.5 is the same at every single point in the circuit. So you can use that current of 1.5 in any calculation in the circuit, but you can't use the same voltage because the voltage would change. So now that you have the current, you need to find the resistance of the entire circuit, which is this and this of AX. You need to find the resistance completely of AX and this here. So when you find the actual resistance of the lamp, we found there was four ohms. And then the resistance of the circuit, we can use the formula, the voltage, which is 12. And the current is always the same with these components added, which is 1.5, which equals to 8 ohms. So now with the entire resistance of the circuit is 8 ohms. When you do the resistance of the circuit minus the resistance of this lamp, you're gonna get four ohms. Now what's four ohms? Four ohms is only the resistance of the wire because there is no other thing, component that contributes to resistance significantly except this wire and the lamp. And that's why this, also, this is also not too close to real life, but if it's close to real life, you would have more complex formulas. Anyway, you were meant to ignore that in uh, GCSE. So, you know AB is one length and its resistance is 5 ohms but since this sliding contact was connected at X you know AX is a length of AX which you don't know and its resistance is 4 ohms now you can't assume that there is 4 ohms because of 4 ohms here but you can assume that since the actual total resistance of the circuit is V by I which is 12 by 1.58 ohms and just because this turned out to be 4 ohms and this was 4 ohms doesn't mean that it's always the same. It could have been 5 and this could have been 3. But anyway, since the entire resistance is 8 and you have to subtract this resistance here because the only other significant resistance is this, you would get 4 ohms. And then, of course, the ratio is, is 1 meter and 1 meter has 5 resistance for AB. And AX is on AB. And its distance is AX, we don't know, but we know its resistance is 4 ohms. So we can put this in a ratio because all of it is proportional to each other. So 1 is to 5, AX is to 4, and then you multiply these together, five, 4 times 1, AX times 5, and then you find the length, 0 0.8, 0 uh, meters, you have meters, you got to put that in. Okay, so for this question, I'm going to answer these two immediately. So north to south, magnetic field lines always go from north to south. If you use Fleming's left hand rule, you always use Fleming's left hand rule unless you, you use the right hand rule for maybe a transformer. That's when you use the right hand rule. So the left hand rule, the up the finger, your thumb is the force, your middle finger is the um, current and the finger that just goes straight is the magnetic field. So what happens is the magnetic field goes from north to south. So make your thing go, your finger go from north to south, which is just making it go face the right. And then your middle finger has to face the other direction. So you rotate it. Now it faces the other direction. 
and if you're doing this with me you can literally see that the force is going downwards so that's how the force goes downwards and then if you reverse the current the force gets reversed that's the thing that happens as always a rule reverse the current the force gets reversed so here you would since P is going to Q in you can see the line is going in the magnetic field would just literally be like this yep you, you see it you understand as well if the currents increase the magnetic field increases yep oh and if you wanted to know why there was no electric field if a s electron is stationary it has an electric field if an electron moves it becomes a charge that moves and that's the definition of current a moving charge and once it becomes current current has a magnetic field not not um, an electrons electrons have electric field once you actually use Fleming's left hand rule you're going to point your because they say a small magnet is placed where the um, where the magnetic field is vertically upward so it's going up state so the magnetic field is going up get Fleming's left hand rule point the magnetic field up which is the the straight index finger and then you, now you have to decide um, on the way that the currents flowing if you check this one here it's going straight which is this direction or yeah which is this direction you could have either first got the direction and then pointed your index finger up but whatever you do when you align the current and the and your index finger your index finger goes up and then you would see your middle finger goes to the right and then you would notice that the force is going it looks to the left if you do it my way which is which if you do it the correct way which I'm gonna repeat again get your Fleming's left hand rule move your index finger up and everything rotates now you'd have your thumb pointing towards you and then you have to rotate your hand in this direction a P to Q your middle finger has to point in the direction P to Q so you just move it and now it's pointing from left to right in a horizontal direction that's facing into the page in the actual page in front of you so we have you have your index finger still going up and you have your middle finger going into the screen which is P to Q you, you see you aligned it properly but then you're going to realize that it's going to look like this actually let me draw it that's your middle finger that's your index finger and this one points like this you're going to have it something like that so your middle finger is here so if this one's going to the left now you realize that the force on the on the wires the, is going to cause the wires to go to the left I mean to the right to the right sorry is going to cause the wires to go to the right but in perspective to the south and north pole that looks like the wire is going down so when the wire goes to the right the it looks like it's going downwards in um, in the perspective of the south pole or north pole when it goes to the left it looks like it goes to the up so it goes downwards that's how you saw that's how you would do that that's how the force would look that's why it goes downwards now that only happens if the magnets were placed on top if they were placed on the sides like this it would be more like the opposites so in this case it goes down the current the wire goes down but to the north pole and south pole since it goes down it looks to them like it's going to the right uh, this one you would let me see if you can see it there I uh, hope you could see that um, yeah this would be good so a diode you know how to draw a diode you can even google that thing up so if you check if you just need to remember all your logic gates it's a NOR gate now coming to this question for part C um, what they want you to do is they say that you connect input 1 and 2 which they already did now they say using the values of B so basically you have to use B's logic gate but B's logic gate when you connect it to another logic gate it should give you this these specific outputs so I connected B's logic gate which was a NOR gate to a OR gate because OR gate gives you the opposite so when I feel um, hold on I'm not gonna explain this part yet but whatever 
you don't have to use the logic gates. You can label them with boxes, but you have to label them or else it's really hard for the examiner to know what the heck you did. But I use the actual gates, but I should have labeled them regardless. So now that I put my NOR gate here, it's going to give me these values. And if I connect my OR gates, I'm going to get these values here, the outputs. And then this one says label your intermediate point X, which I put here. Complete the table with the logic levels for this point in the blank column. So these outputs are the intermediate points values because when you combine these two, because it's an OR gate, because they tell you to use B, B's logic gate, you're going to get these specific outputs. But these outputs, when they're put, the output for this gate is the input for this gate. So whatever the output here for this gate is, is going to input into this gate and this one is an OR gate so it's going to change it to the opposite of the number and then you're going to get this. Anyway, if you wanna, this is where you have to just remember the logic gates. So this is what I did. I should have labeled it as well but yeah, hope you guys get it. So the gold nuclei, in a nuclei it's pr protons and neutrons, that's all. There's no electrons. So when it's so close, it's going to instantly um, deflect back. This one is going to curve and go down because alpha particles are positive. But this one, you've got a positive force pushing in an equal direction here and an equal direction here. So it's just going to squish this together while this moves with its velocity in this direction. I think it's going to change that. For this one, um, now you have to state why. This could happen due to the background radiation. So you have to say it varies. And you say it, var it varies because of background radiation. There are two marks. Now this one is two marks. You would say it would protect the technician from alpha particles. Because remember, even a few centimeters of air can stop alpha particles. But not from beta radiation. That's it. And then you get your two marks. Well, I hope you enjoy this. If you need more specific help with setting questions, feel free to ask me below.